like to invite everybody uh, to come to the table and we can get started. Uh, I thought we should start with a uh, cartoon to introduce a little bit of levity into this discussion. Um, the nation has some serious problems in the quality of higher education. We're going to be looking at those in detail, but let's start at least with a, a lighter view of this issue, and then we'll return to the subject of historical illiteracy. Uh, we have two extraordinary education leaders with us today, uh, Governor John Engler and Judge Richard Bray. Uh, I'm going to um, introduce them at greater length uh, in a moment. Uh, but just a, a, a quick preview, John Engler was governor of Michigan from 1991 to 2003. Uh, and in office, he waged a campaign on behalf of better education standards. Uh, he's continuing that outstanding work as the president of the Business Roundtable, uh, with, where he assumed office in January 2011, uh, after six years as the president and CEO of the National Association of Manufacturers. Judge Richard Bray um, served on the circuit court of his native Portsmouth, uh, joined the Virginia Court of Appeals in 1991, where he served until 2002, and now in, as president and the CEO of the Beasley Foundation, has started something quite revolutionary in the world of higher education funders by making quality measures the key element in funding decisions. Uh, like Gall, our um, presentation will be divided into three parts. I'm going to uh, start with a, a view of the academic issues involved in the decline in core standards and the challenge that poses to academic excellence. Then Governor Engler uh, will approach this from the point of view of employers and business. And then uh, Judge Richard Bray will approach it from the point of view of a funder who intends to change the way things happen. And let's get right to the heart of the issue. Some guiding questions. How do we, in higher education, respond to the charge that there is a higher education bubble, that we are buying and selling a product that is not worth the cost? If higher education cannot demonstrate that it adds value to fundamental skills and knowledge, then it is indeed an overpriced failure. Every faculty member, every administrator, every trustee needs to be able to give an articulate answer to the question when asked, what makes you confident that you have done your job when you see a student at your institution receive a diploma? Uh, if they cannot give an articulate answer to that question, a truthful answer, then you can truly see higher education, to use the words in Bill McGurn's excellent Wall Street Journal column that appeared earlier this week, in fact, quoting our own President Ann Neal, then it is indeed time to occupy the ivory tower. <laughs> well, let's start with something that I know uh, that Governor Engler will be taking up in greater detail. Uh, what do employers see? And I, I want to look in particular at that third bullet. They see more than a quarter of the newly hired four-year college graduates with deficient writing abilities. The problems of higher education quality are very real. Uh, here we see an absolute smoking gun. And these weaknesses have real consequences. Uh, I have, by the way, left printed copies of my PowerPoint slides since I confess I'll be going through these pretty quickly, so people who want to see these stats in greater detail can pick up a copy outside. The fact of the matter is that there is no such thing as preparing a graduate for a job that's going to last. The Bureau of Labor Statistics shows us that the change is almost inevitable, and that change will occur all the way through life. Sending students out in the world with expensive diplomas, but without fundamental skills, is a disgrace and a malfeasance. And the evidence of how bad it is has been mounting. I'm sure you're all familiar with the new book, Academically Adrift, published by University of Chicago Press. Its findings are apocalyptically horrifying. Uh, look in, in particular at the uh, type in red. After four expensive years of college, 
36% of the graduates did not demonstrate any significant growth in cognitive skills as measured by a very reliable instrument. The CLA is an excellent tool. I'm proud to say that ACTA has been working closely with Professor Aram, the lead author of this work. Uh, 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 Professor Aram wrote to all of ACTA's trustees, some 10,000, advising them of the crucial danger that they face. Now, let, let me respond immediately to a um, charge that's often made. Well, that 36% refers to students at other places. It doesn't have anything to do with our fine school. Well, totally wrong. What <coughs> Professor Aram and Roxa found was that the variation within institutions in student outcomes was greater than that between institutions. In other words, to put it in the most horrifyingly blunt terms, a family can spend $200,000 or more on an education and the student will leave with no significant improvement in intellectual ability, no smarter than when he or she entered. Uh, and to finish this morality play, Aram did a longitudinal study from the class of 2009 and showed that 31% of the students had moved back in with their parents after graduation. Uh, the majority of them earn less than 30,000 per year. 9% are totally without work. In many ways, academically adrift should have come as no surprise. The National Assessment of Adult Literacy, repeated uh, both in 1992 and 2003, shows that most, co most college graduates have only intermediate level basic skills. W what does that mean? Proficiency, which they do not have on average, means that they could compare viewpoints in two editorials or compute and compare the cost per ounce of food items the kind of thing that we would probably expect of reasonably intelligent middle school students. But most college graduates, according to this huge federal study repeated twice, lack those foundational skills. And we see the way that it corrupts culture. This is a survey of student engagement, and as you'll see, most students are working outside of class less than 15 hours a week. 12 to, 15 hours of 12 to 15 hours in class, 12 to 15 hours outside of class, less than a full-time job for that expensive education, and obviously encouraged by their institutions to do so because their grade point averages are generally quite robust. Friday classes, Monday morning classes, no. A whole range of social pathologies that stem from poor standards, not just lack of skills. Well, ACTA has responded with the What Will They Learn project. You have a copy of that um, at your places. And what we are doing is shining a light on just how badly higher education is letting down students across the nation. <clears throat> Barely 5% of our 1,000 plus schools require economics. Only 20% require a basic course in American history or government. Barely over 15% require intermediate level foreign language. More than a third don't require college level math. And nearly 17%, getting back to that figure from um, business leaders, nearly 17% don't even require a basic course in writing. The core matters. The core is where liberal arts are put into reality, and that's why ACTA has launched the large What Will They Learn project. Historical illiter illiteracy, which is where we started, is no joke. Um, it may, for a moment, be amusing that most students know Beavis and Butthead much better than James Madison and the US Constitution, but these students, who will be the leaders of our country, are civically disempowered. They do not know how laws are put into reality. Um, and when civic knowledge breaks down, civic virtue is soon going to follow. When Richard Aram wrote to the trustees in ACTA's network, he asked them in the bluntest of terms 
Take a hard look at your general education requirements. Does your institution have meaningful core requirements for graduation that ensure a rigorous education regardless of major? He's asking our trustees the questions that we hope will spur them to move their institutions to a rigorous set of requirements that will ensure students who have a fighting chance of success in career and community. And look at the emboldened line at the end of what he admonishes our trustees with. They are putting these students and our country's future at risk. Is ACTA too demanding? No. We have no option. Uh, it gives us, I have to say, as the director of that project, it gives us no pleasure to be handing out F's and D's any more than it gave me any pleasure when I was a college professor. But it is in the best interest of students, and in this case institutions, to let them know when they are failing and letting down our students and our nation. And let's see some examples of what goes into bad core curricula. This is the most prestigious school that claims it has a writing requirement. So uh, students learn their writing in a biology class or in a chemistry class uh, slash environmental class. And uh, I have to say, if you look at the red print on that slide, even the instructor that put the course requirement description into the catalog couldn't write correctly. Uh, please, you know, give us a break. No wonder employers are dismayed. Uh, Stanley Fish, um, not usually somebody that ACTA has a lot of common ground with, uh, had nothing but approbation for ACTA's push towards strong college composition requirements. He used even stronger language that we do. The courses that lack real focus on writing mechanics are a sham. All over the country we see things that are called core curricula, but they are, as Judge Bray um, has put in clear legal terms, a fraud. Uh, that's to say, um, a distributional curriculum um, is not nourishing. It does not ensure that students will get the things that they need. Uh, it's great that there's seven sections of American history, but students could just as easily take jazz or history of Western music or philosophy of the environment and learn nothing about the way our nation works. Well, um, I, I want to end quickly so that we can get on to the rest of our program, but let me not leave us in gloom and despair. The tide is turning. University of Sciences and the Arts in Oklahoma doesn't charge much money, but look at what they say about a real core curriculum. They've done the hard work, they've come together as a faculty and put together a strong, rigorous program. And ACTA helps them celebrate. When a school does what the University of the Sciences and the Arts in Oklahoma does, we give them an A. They've now made up pins that they award um, and give out to their alumni. Here, um, opera singer Margaret uh, Singer, a uh, great name for a soprano, uh, came back from Paris to receive her, what will they learn, A pin from her alma mater. Uh, and the Secretary of Education in Oklahoma has taken notice. This school is properly profiled and rewarded for what it does for its students. We see bad excuses and shams all over, the sad work of what will they learn, but we also see schools that get it right. Fairfield University is not a famous school. We put it on our hidden gem site to give it profile and to celebrate its achievements. What a brilliant insight into what college math is. Every student at Fairfield University, regardless of major, will learn some calculus. None of this dumbed down remedial style fulfillment of requirements. And Fairfield's faculty understands that mathematics is a liberal art. The course treats mathematics as an art for its aesthetic beauty and as a science. This is great teaching. And we're delighted to profile sectors that have done well. Here, Michael Lomax, Dr. Lomax, the president and CEO of the United Negro College Fund, takes pride in the fact that ACTA's review found that as a sector, HBCUs have clung tightly to a strong and disciplined core curriculum, strong in mathematics, strong in the natural sciences, strong in the other disciplines. And the Washington Post has taken notice of this. 
that slowly but surely there is broad agreement that the general ed system is flawed and some presidents, and we hope lots of trustees, are calling for stronger core requirements. And ACT as What Will They Learn project is paving the way. And our friends from William and Mary here in force actually have a better title now than Restore the Core. They're looking to the future, not to the past. Um, and they are bringing lots and lots of profile to this issue on their campus. We couldn't do this um, without all of you helping. It's been extremely exciting. Our project is getting lots of impact, 160,000 visits to the website just this last week on a single day, November 1st, 14,000 visits. We've seen op-eds by Kathleen Parker, by Bill McGurn, coverage in the major newspapers around the country, reaching some 15 million people. We're working closely with the collegiate learning assessment uh, that has brought so much light to, to the strengths and weaknesses of higher education. Um, and we're working with the Association of Public Land Grant Colleges and Universities. President McPherson will be here later today. I want to end by thanking all of the people in this room and our many supporters. This is a campaign that we cannot lose. The future of our country depends on it, and we couldn't do it without you. And with that, uh, let me uh, turn this over to Governor Engler um, and to um, advise you that our, the full speaker's bios are out in the hallway or in your packets. Please read a little bit about the, the eminent people that have come to be with us today. And let's see if we can get this machine to click off. Um, maybe not. Um, yes, okay. Governor Engler. Well, thank you very much, Michael. I am delighted and I want to thank the uh, American Council of Trustees and Alumni uh, for your efforts uh, to promote educational quality. It, uh, it's important work and it reminds uh, alumni and trustees across the country of our responsibility to future generations. And I'm, I'm pleased really to have an opportunity to spend some time with you this morning and uh, be able to be here for the full hour. We got worried yesterday. I'm going to meet with Speaker Boehner this morning. but. Uh, it got pushed back. We were able to get it to noon, so I'm, I'm able to be here for the whole program. And uh, I, I want to start out by just saying, sort of in the spirit of all of this, I've been paying a little attention. Uh, hard to miss it, especially if you're in Washington, uh, the Occupy Wall Street uh, protests that are going on. And so many of them, if you think about it, they seem to be recent college graduates who are deep in debt. Uh, there was an account of a 22-year-old graduate from Ithaca College. He spent the summer renting canoes at a state park. Uh, as Michael pointed out, he moved back home. He was one of those statistics. And uh, after a month or two of an unsuccessful job search, he uh, relocated to a park in Manhattan. And he told the reporter that uh, I've I've got a degree, so I, I you know so I wouldn't be in this position. Well, uh, what's the position? Ninety thousand in debt, and unemployed. Now he eventually wants to go back to college uh, so he can become an elementary school teacher. Uh, but a very wise woman said the other day, if these students and grads understood the real issues with college debt, they would change their focus from Occupy Wall Street to Occupy the Ivory Tower. And that was Ann who said that. Michael referenced that earlier. But uh, that was in a Wall Street Journal a column that uh, was entitled by Bill McGurn and said, what's your kid getting from college? And, and I'm a parent of uh, three daughters, uh, juniors in high school. So this is all real uh, current and real because we're in that in that process. It does appear from the amount of mail that arrives at our house every day that uh, one area to uh, receive some uh, trimming back is just, just the outreach. Uh, but boy, the recruitment's in, in, in full. And uh, yes, there are three. They're triplet daughters. So they're, uh, it's, it's a big challenge. I, I'm just glad to be out of the house every day, you know, to be able to get away. But uh, there's no question that, um, you know, when you think about uh, what is your kid getting out of college, when the answer is debt, anger, a couch at mom and dad's, uh, something's really wrong. And uh, more and more people, uh, and Michael used that phrase this morning, he might have been the inventor of the phrase, I'm not sure, but the higher education bubble. Now, they're usually focusing on cost, that, that reference, but uh, we certainly need to focus uh, just as much on quality. and. 
I think students, it's imperative that they gain the knowledge and skills to succeed in the global economy in which we live, uh, and that's the world in which American based business uh, not only exists and operates, but competes. And so uh, the Business Roundtable, which is, was mentioned, I've been privileged to lead since January. Uh, we've got 211 chief executive officers of leading, for the most part, almost all U.S.-based, uh, U.S. headquartered companies. They produce some $6 trillion in revenues, employ uh, right around 14 million people. Uh, we invest just in our membership, more than $150 billion annually in research and development. Uh, so these are substantial enterprises, and that's about half of all the private U.S. R&D spending that takes place on an annual basis. And so uh, we're, we're pretty committed to the idea of technology, the importance of innovation, and how that's essential to drive economic growth uh, and productivity in our economy. So there's keen interest in college students uh, who gain a high quality education in math and science and uh, having that be part of a core curriculum. Uh, the, the idea of getting good grades of uh, graduating degrees in one of these fields is it is the case that that today does lead to employment and that certainly in most cases is a salary that is, is certainly well able to deal with some of these massive debts that some of these young people are incurring. But uh, part of the point of coming this morning and part of our focus, and it's been interesting, uh, just uh, in September, uh, Rex Tillerson, the German CEO of ExxonMobil, agreed to head our, our Committee on Education and Workforce. He said, well, that's, that's kind of, would he be doing energy work or uh, environment? No, his, his real passion is education and workforce because he understands the challenge that we've got. And we need more than just uh, research scientists and, and engineers, and, uh, and and sometimes we have a hard time even finding uh, candidates w with basic skills. Uh, Doug Oberhelman, uh, who's the CEO of Caterpillar, uh, told a group the other day, this is a quote, we cannot find qualified hourly production people, and for that matter, many technical engineering service technicians and even welders. That hurts our manufacturing base in the United States. And and I think this is part of this discussion, that the truth is you don't always need a four-year degree. Uh, we've gotten a little carried away with that in this country, and, um, and I, I know that uh, from time to time people talk about increasing graduation rates, and, uh, and clearly uh, you could do that in college if you begin to graduate those you admit. Uh, and that there, you could double the graduation rate uh, right there without, admit, without saying I've got to have a big outreach program. Uh, my problem is I'm not admitting enough. No, you're graduating too few. But uh, it isn't always a four-year degree that's necessary because there are uh, the kind of technical jobs that Doug is referring to exist in pretty much every company. And in many cases, many of those are essential to supporting the work of the research scientist. Uh, uh, a biochemist engineer might need uh, you know, 15 technical support people on that team. And, and they could maybe receive technical training in a specialized program. Uh, we've got other jobs where uh, apprentice programs would be uh, exactly what uh, is required. And in some cases, um, uh, some of the very fine community college programs get you right to that place. It's interesting that not only can those kind of programs provide skills that are uh, still essential in today's uh, competitive work environment and, and necessary to retain in this country if we're going to compete globally, but it's interesting, it, today it, it is also some evidence that that historical evidence of the value of the college degree uh, over, the, you know, the, the high school degree, uh, that it, it, you know, and I think over a lifetime that's as much as a half million dollars more in earning, uh, that, that it certainly has narrowed uh, or in some cases been eliminated for people who've got skills. Uh, I, I always often joke about out in Northern Virginia where we happen to be living temporarily that the uh, you know, you try to get a plumber or electrician to come to your house, and you're the one that's calling them. They're telling you, well, maybe between 8 and noon, uh, you know, in two weeks. On Tuesday, if you need to see a dentist, they're calling you. Are you coming? Are you going to be here? You want to confirm this. It's completely turned around. Who's the professional? And I wonder who's got the second home at the lake on the weekend these days, you know. So uh, anyway, 
Uh, business is, is not passive. We donate about $3 billion to uh, K-12 education on an annualized basis. A lot of that comes from uh, some of these member companies. Companies also recognize that in addition to what they might contribute, there's a tremendous amount of training that uh, just goes with running an enterprise today. You're going to bring people in and you're going to train them in the Caterpillar way. Uh, in fact, many of our uh, companies, Caterpillar University, uh, ITT uh, has programs, even so, I mean, so many of them have their own university programs uh, that, that deal with what the company needs. Uh, but it's, it's surprising the reports that we have about college grads who come in and, and they fall short of expectations, and that's what some of the data that Michael's slides were showing, the critical skills uh, and thinking that are necessary that you develop. Uh, when you can write well, when you can communicate uh, the critical skills of economics, uh, a, a sense of history. And Anne, I thought Anne's quote, uh, she talked about, this was in that same article about what your kid getting from college. She said that, uh, you know, you, you want to have um, students leaving college a broad base of knowledge will allow them to compete successfully in our globalized economy and to make sense of the modern world. And boy, that's true. I mean, um, I, I think when you, and Michael Slides again touched on this. If you if you think we've got a, a, a world where 36 percent of the kids, after the investment that's required, don't demonstrate any significant improvements in learning after four years, you, you kind of got to say what's what's the point here? And that's why the work of the council is so important, because that is economic waste. It's it's a waste of money for parents and, and the students. It's a waste of money for taxpayers. And taxpayers are not just this, you know, kind of passive on the side here, or shouldn't be, because uh, they're investing today, uh, data would show more than $60,000 for each bachelor's degree for a basic degree, as much as $100,000 for degrees that come from flagship institutions. So the, the public support uh, in many of these uh, public institutions is rather, rather substantial, even in a time of, of tightening budgets and uh, fiscal constraint. But most significantly, it's a waste of human potential of the talent. And what it does is it hurts us in terms of our ability to compete as a nation, because there's, there's no question that knowledge in the 21st century is one of the uh, great uh, differentiators, I think, among economies and, and successful uh, growth-oriented economies. And we've got to keep up. Uh, we've always viewed, and uh, we have many strengths that we've looked back on. Uh, I have an article that's in the Washington Times today. They ask some of us to write about what, what's going to make a difference, what, what do, whether the candidates in 2012 need to be focused on. Uh, I tried to do it this way. You know, the world's got 7 billion people today. We've only got a little more than 300 million of them here. And, and, and just take a country like India that's a, a, a rising competitor in a number of ways. I mean, they're just an example, but a good one. They're rapidly modernizing. They're expanding. A middle class, it's vast. Uh, educational opportunities are expanding, um, and and it's highly competitive. In fact, uh, I have an Indian friend who told me that he, he made the joke that uh, uh, you know he, he came over here to go to school. He said you know he didn't realize he was smart until he got to the United States. Uh, <laughs> you know, which uh, pretty good line. I, I told him that yeah, and, and, and meaning uh, that that in, in this case uh, you know. You know, some of the kids and his friends were in the top Indian technical schools. Those who weren't quite in those schools, but then came over here and said, "Gee, here I am at the top of my my game." But uh, you think about just India again, four to five times the population of the U.S. You know, you've got to look and say the odds are going to be that the next Steve Jobs is going to come out of Bangalore, not out of Silicon Valley. And and are we prepared and are, are we understanding that? And and is that something we just accept, or do we say no? Our, our, we, got, we may be 300 and some million, but we've still got a youngish population and we're, we're ready to compete. But we need the people to be able to successfully compete, and a lot of those have to be our, our college graduates. Uh, one thing that the roundtable is going to put some focus on also is, you know, what's being done prior to college, because we, we think that's important. Uh, we spend $650 billion a year, far more than any other nation in the world, on that investment to, to get people to that point. And, and a, lot of, um, a lot of money, as I said, we spend $3 billion, uh, probably foundations, and that's been equally that or more. 
uh, and then the, and then all of that I point out is a is a pittance compared to what taxpayers are spending. I mean, it's just a drop in the ocean. So if you're going to spend that money, I, I've always believed for some time now that you better spend it to try to figure out how you move the 650. We do not have enough private sector money, despite how generous the nation is and how much philanthropy. We can't simply replace. We can't build alongside the 650 billion another system even if we could be a lot more efficient and do it for 400 billion or something you, you just not you got to change uh, you, you know you got to you got to change the empire there a little bit and so uh, I, I've, I've said you could simplify this in some ways because what you really have to have today and there's a there's an article in our packet about the big ideas and one of them is to end remediation but clearly every child ought to leave at that high school experience not needing remediation at the next step. Uh, I mean, that, that would be true wherever you're going to go. If you're going to go to community college, you're going to go to university, you should not need remediation when you get there. You ought to be able to do the work. We've already paid for that. Second, uh, since I said not everybody needs to go to college, everybody, if they're not, if they're going to go to the workforce, and I do believe you ought to continue your education or training or you ought to go to the workforce. I, I think the, the third option of not working or prison is not a really good choice you know those those don't work well for us but if you're going to go to the workforce then you ought to be going with a skill that's measured and certified and we've de-emphasized to our detriment uh, that kind of uh, what used to be the old old phrase was vocational education but but uh, whatever that career education skills training is today I mean there kind of ought to be a plan interesting enough we do that for everybody that's in uh, in the special education program, one of the mandates there is that you have an individualized education plan. We don't do that for the kid who needs to go to work. Uh, maybe besides, and you can always you can always be um, a poet if you want to go off and be a poet. You can do that. Um, but if that isn't going to pay the bills, you can also do that after you become a plumber. Uh, you know, you you, you know we, we had a you know there's lots of examples, but you better have a skill. Hopefully that's been measured and even even certified. And then finally, uh, what's the other thing? The dropout rate. It has to be zero. I mean, you either better get prepared, continue your education, get prepared, get your skill, get a job. I mean, we, we, we actually need everyone. Uh, we've got jobs in this country that uh, no one wishes to do. It's one of the reasons the immigration debate is, is such a contentious debate. But, but that's, that's really what we've got to have, and we ought to have a plan for that. I mean, even the military day doesn't want someone who hasn't finished, at a minimum, their high school education and training. So, so that's, our, that's our challenge, it seems to me. The, the ability uh, here, uh, in terms of our discussion, and I look forward to kind of our conversation a little bit later on, but embrace the education quality and, and the core that ACTA promotes very effectively. That helps, and, and business has an interest in that because that, that frankly helps us compete. And when we can compete more effectively, uh, that 9% unemployment rate was largely unchanged again this morning. Uh, you know, you start to get economic growth. You get, um, you start to create demand. Lots of good things happen from that. You play the other way, unprepared. Uh, I mean, some of the data in the articles that are in our packets about how little uh, even time devoted to homework. It's no wonder when somebody finally leaves school and you go take a job, that first job, you say, you want me to do what? <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. Because that's the other point in this article in the Washington Times today. I point out that, you know, Washington appears now ready to shut down, get ready for the 2012 election. You know, we've got, it's really hard. We're getting ready for another election, you know. And guess what? Everybody around the world is not waiting for us to have an election. They're not stopping. They won't take the year off while we wait for an election. And then the reaction is, once the election's over, whew, that was a hard election. We better rest after the election, get our energy up to go forward. I mean, we're taking on, I think, a world where it's relentless because people looked at the American experience and concluded from that, there's much to desire. There's much that's good. We can do it. We can replicate that. And look what they built uh, on that basis. So let's us go do it, and we can even do it better today. And if we don't understand that and accept the competition, uh, I think we have to be prepared to accept a status that I don't want for my three daughters in their lives, and that would be a second-rate status. Uh, we, we should, we got plenty to do, work to be done, but we've got to be smart, prepared, and willing to work hard. You're doing that at ACTA, and 
the Business Roundtable will be proud to be a partner with you as we work hard together. Thank you. Governor Engler, thank you very much. It was um, one of the several things that made me very sad about leaving Michigan in 1991 to um, see the energy and the things that were beginning to happen as you were leading the state. And um, we're very, very grateful for the leadership that you've shown, not just in business and industry, but in aligning the education system with those important goals that are the, the lifeblood of our society. Well, I'm going to introduce now um, Judge Richard Bray, and then after his presentation, we'll take some time for uh, questions and answers. Uh, Judge Richard Bray is changing, as I said before, the whole dynamic of funding and higher education, and is going to, if I may say this about somebody who's been a um, judge on the Virginia Court of Appeals, starting a revolution. <laughs> you know, I was I enjoyed Dr. Wood's presentation so much with respect to the differences between the North and the South, and I, I'm, I'm part of the indigenous peoples of the South. <laughs> uh, I felt like at one point I was a keeper of the colonial flame. Uh, I was born and raised in Tidewater, Virginia, uh, within shooting distance of Williamsburg and Jamestown. I have visited Plymouth Rock. I didn't see much to it. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I am defensive of the South, but of course that's with slavery aside. I'm, I'm defensive of the South, and I recognize that. And his points were well taken, that it was a tremendous economic differences that brought on much of the conflict and the misunderstanding because the country was fractured economically, dramatically fractured. And of course I was taught that at Randolph-Macon, and I didn't forget it. But, but what, what I'd like to, to bring to you all is our experience as a funder. My first actor conference was, I think, four years ago at Harvard. Um, Lawrence Summers spoke, uh, as he will today. Uh, ben Oshmit, uh, Schmidt spoke, the uh, past president of Yale. Uh, both of them addressed the faculty issue and the intransigence of the faculties to accept change and, and what had the evolution of higher education in this country, and I, uh, the downward evolution of the unwinding of quality higher education. And that was my first introduction to it. And our foundation funds hundreds of thousands of dollars into higher education. And I've been, been signed, I was on the board, that we, when I was on the Court of Appeals, I went on the foundation board in 1993, and, and the trustees asked me if I would accept the presidency in 2002. Uh, so I was, you would think uh, would be aware of what was going on in higher education, but I was not aware of it. And it was actor that educated me. And we've been writing blank checks for a long time. A lot of those checks go to the Virginia Foundation of Independent Colleges. I just signed a check to them for $625,000, which concluded a commitment to them. We also fund, that's 13 colleges, uh, two of the 15 we do not fund. We do not fund Washington and Lee and University of Richmond because they have over a billion dollar endowments. Of course, that probably changed Monday and Tuesday. But anyway, they have <laughs> over a billion dollar endowments and we didn't think Mr. Beasley would look kindly on that uh, with the Taft Foundation giving them money. So we fund 13 of the 15. Uh, we fund them both through VFIC and individually and we fund five uh, colleges through the Virginia College Fund and they're the less endowed schools in the western part of the state. Uh, so we're very much involved in higher education, both from the standpoint of, of providing endowments for scholarship funding <clears throat> and in funding capital projects. <clears throat> so they'll come to us for, t for technological needs and such, and we'll fund those. In addition to that, we give away hundreds of thousands of dollars annually uh, to high school students in our region to go to college in the college of their choice. So it really was unforgivable that we knew so little about what was happening in higher education. We just assumed, like so many parents and maybe so many in this room, of course many of you educators and, uh, and, and you recognize this over a period of years, but we just assumed that the colleges and universities were doing their job and they were educating the children. They were educating them the liberal arts. Uh, I've always said the liberal arts uh, open the door to your mind and build a foundation uh, so that you can acquire the knowledge that you're going to need 
and the skills that you're going to need when you go out into the marketplace. You will be trained later. Your mind is tuned and the foundation is built for you to learn. If you don't have an appreciation of literature, of language, of writing skills and composition, uh, if you have no math, substantive math or science, these are areas that are absolutely critical. Economics, if you don't understand economics in the world today, you're, you're ignorant. So when you're being told that you have a liberal arts education, albeit you're a generalist, and you have no background in any of the, no substantive background in any of these courses, a fraud has been committed. And, and it's, I call it a civil fraud, but it's nevertheless a fraud. It's a misrepresentation. So the student goes out. The student, uh, my law clerks would come to me beginning in 1991 and right on through until I left. The court uh, took early retirement to, to assume the uh, position at Beasley, would write a paragraph that'd be a page and a half long. It would express three thoughts in one paragraph, sometimes unco uh, incoherent, sometimes a sentence without, without a subject or without a predicate. These were kids, these were law school graduates who uh, had graduated in the top of their classes. Uh, when I was in college, and I know most of you were in college, if you wrote a, a, a paper in history, you, you were, our professors redlined not just content, but also composition. And sometimes there was more blood on my papers on composition <laughs> than it was on content. <laughs> Professor said you knew the history, but you sure don't remember much about writing it. And uh, all of that was, was critical and very important to, 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 to the graduate and serves the graduate well throughout their, throughout their lives. So anyway, we decided, after that first conference, I decided that we had to do something about this. We had to educate ourselves. So I presented to the board over a period of years what was going on. The board was very attuned to it, just eight of us on the board including me, we all know one another, we're all from the uh, southeastern Virginia region. And we decided to commission ACTA, because we weren't in a position to do it, to commission ACTA to do a study, which uh, they produced for us, uh, a white paper, we have not released it. Uh, it studies 25 colleges and universities that we have, have endowed or, or regularly funded in capital projects. And we wanted to know what was going on in those colleges and universities. And it was not a pretty picture. Uh, when the report came, it was, uh, it was alarming, it was distressing, and it was surprising. More surprising to the other self than, than to me, because I had been, as I said, educated by ACTA. But in any event, the issue became, well, what are we going to do about this? It's almost, you know, what's worse, knowing where Bin Laden is or not knowing where he is. Once you find out where he is, you got to do something about it. So when we found that we had this problem, uh, we decided we were going to have to address it. <clears throat> we didn't want to release the report, which we're going to release the report and through ACTA. But we want to release the report with a positive spin. So we said, well, what can we do? So we're working now with a, a small liberal arts college in, in Virginia, which has an extraordinary tradition of a very strong core curriculum a very strong academic uh, tradition and a great history. Uh, we're working with them and we chose them, uh, selected them because they were very close. They were B++ to an Act A. There are no Act A's in Virginia, incidentally, no Act A's. They would be an Act A very easily with just a little bit of tweaking. And I thought this would be an easy deal. Why I thought that, I don't know, because we had been taught by act time and again that the, the faculty resistance was substantial. And that's exactly what we've run into. It's been an unbelievable experience. Uh, I've been in contact with, we've had three, four, four meetings uh, at the college with the president who was very, very supportive, dynamic man, well-educated, brilliant, a great feature in education, no question about that. Academic dean or provost, we met with him. Uh, some of the trustees, we met with some of the trustees. But ultimately, the issue keeps going back to the faculty, excuse me. Ultimately, the issue keeps going back to the faculty, and that's where the 
The difficulty is I got a call last week and the president told me that one of the, one of the faculty members said, well, why don't we just make the change and not take the money? And I said, well, that's fine with me. I said, <laughs> we, uh, we, but the, obviously, to, to, to make the change in this particular instance, the change would be in economics. So we're willing to pay an economics professor for a period of years. We're willing to leave the school with a $100,000 endowment. Uh, at, at, at the conclusion of, of two or three years when they build this bridge economically into, into this uh, extra additional course of, in, of intense study. So we think the offer is pretty generous. Um, I've been waiting for a number back. Obviously, I haven't told him how much money we're willing to give to fund that professor, but I'm waiting for his number. But you, you can get the idea that our approach is to, is, is, is to be constructive so that when we when the report is released, as negative and damning as it is, when the report is released, we can simultaneously release what we have done with one college and we plan to do, hope, hope, hope to do, with one public college or university in Virginia so that we have two colleges, one public, one private, to, to indicate to the, to the philanthropic world uh, what can be done to improve the situation and it, the, the log jam at the colleges in the faculty area uh, can be broken. You know, you wonder, uh, what, where is the governance here? I guess governance is something that's being involved in, in, in government as, as the governor has. You, you, you realize that governance and chain of command are all very important. So you think the trustees hire the president, the president is in charge of operations and administration, and the faculty worked for the president. They worked for the college. Uh, no. <laughs> I can tell you this. That's not the case at all. The presidents are very, very timid. Uh, they're, they're fearful of the, of the faculty. I don't want to damn the faculty, I'll, the faculties, because I, I was taught by great professors, many of whom I remember today and, and, and admire very much uh, for what they gave me. But of course, that was in 1964 through 68 undergraduate school, so it was a different time. Uh, but we're going through a, a period now of, of this governance issue, which working through the trustees, we just came back from the from philanthropy roundtable in Arizona, <clears throat> where this was also a subject of discussion. Uh, at that conference, <clears throat> as many of you know, there are uh, great representation, substantial representation from very wealthy uh, family and private foundations, which are deeply involved in higher education. And when I say higher education, I, I don't mean to exclude K through 12, because we, we also give tremendous sums to, in K through 12, both to public and private uh, secondary schools. Many foundations don't fund private secondary schools. We fund private secondary schools simply because the father of our foundation, Mr. Beasley, Mr. Fred Beasley, was intensely interested in private education. He started a military school, and he started a college, Frederick College. <clears throat> which he ultimately gave to the Commonwealth of Virginia to begin Tidewater Community College along with the check for a million dollars uh, to facilitate the operation of the college in the first year. Tidewater Community College now has 58,000 students on five campuses in our area. And that opens uh, to me an issue that the governor raised, and that is the, the value of a college degree. There's no question that a number of things have happened in this country, and it's undeniable. We have preached college, 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 until the point where these young people believe if they don't go to college, they're going to fail. So they, they're not interested in career training. They go to college. Well, they'll find a college, and it'll be an inferior college, such as one in our area, where 13% uh, of the freshman cohorts graduate in four years. Uh, that's not a college in, in, in my mind. 13% of, of the freshman cohorts graduate in four years. Less than 50% in six years. So they'll find a college, open enrollment. They come out, they have a degree, they've been taught that this is some measure of entitlement and certainly occupational entitlement. It's a ticket. They can be, be able to get a job and. They're going to work eight hours, and they don't intend to work much more than that. <laughs> uh, that's the culture, the two. I'm sure the governor is aware of that. 
But in, in any event, of course, they're disappointed. So we have really cheapened the value of a college education. Uh, I don't know how we get around that. We're uh, getting around it, or we're beginning to address that because we're going to be giving more and more money to career training. At our community college level, there's a, a very, very efficient, realistic, effective interface between private business and the courses that are being taught at the community college. When these kids graduate, they have a job. Whether it's in nursing, whether it's in nuclear welding, whatever it might be, they have a job. Those that are graduating in, this, in the certificated course, associate degree in automobile mechanics, for example, and it has an academic component, it's a three-year program, has an academic component to it too, a uh, core curriculum, if you will. Every one of, the, every, every one of them is beginning a, 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 a occupation with an automobile dealership in the area with a, a salary of at least $50,000 and benefits, and some are now making over $125,000 a year. The students are not aware of that. The advisors, the career counselors, they're all telling them, you got to go to college. You got to go to college. If you don't go to college, you're not going to mount anything, as my father used to say. Uh, but uh, it's not true. So I think that, that there's really uh, uh, two perspectives on this thing. One is let's make college meaningful again. Let's make it substantial. Let's make it worthwhile. Uh, let's require it to discharge its responsibilities, to do what it's paid substantial dollars to do, University of Richmond over $40,000 a year, Randolph-Macon, my, uh, my uh, alma mater, uh, 40, uh, $40,000, $38,000 a year, Hampton, Sydney, $38,000 a year. Of course, they say nobody pays retail, but well, somebody's paying retail. Uh, but in any event, a lot of money is being invested in higher education. Uh, and these people cannot, young people cannot find jobs. So we need to, we need to, we had, need to look at the other perspective, and that is, get off of this college thing a little bit and start talking about alternatives that will fulfill the needs of the marketplace. There, you just don't need. Uh, the governor will tell you, manufacturers and business people just don't need, but so many people sitting behind a desk. They need, and, that, and that's what middle, that's what middle management is all about, and that's why our middle management is being decimated, because the business is finding they don't need them. But if, they have a, if they're schooled in a trade or an occupation or a profession such as nursing, which surely is an occupation, they can, a uh, profession, they can go anywhere in the world and carry that knowledge with them. It's totally portable. But we've ignored that in recent years and talked about college, college, college. <coughs> so we've got two issues. One being the, the quality of the education that they're receiving, and we're trying to address that by incentivizing the schools to modify their curriculum so that the students are getting a substantial education. If they are unable to attain that substantial education for one reason or another, they should not get a degree. And the other thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to, to build upon the concept that a career training, an associate's degree from a, from a, a community college and a career occupation is very valuable. And the idea of not going to college does not spell a failure, does not mean that you're dumb, does not mean you're unqualified. Many of you in this room know, have experienced personally that uh, uh, Students sometimes are just unsuited for college. Now, it may be uh, their the interest or whatever it might be, but they're not suited for college anyway. They'd much rather be an automobile mechanic. It has nothing to do with their intellect. So these are the areas where uh, we're working. We've become, I hope, a whole lot more sophisticated with, with the uh, help of Dr. Polikoff and, and Ann Neal and ACTA. We're going to be working more and more toward looking uh, at a result-oriented grant making, uh, which is, of course, going to end in some defunding uh, schools that are not qualified and will not cooperate and are intransigent will not be funded. Uh, and 
we have the pre-incoming president of the VFIC, uh, George Birdsong, who's a wonderful man, a very intelligent man, very successful businessman, Birdsong Peanuts and Suffolk. Many of you may have heard of it. You buy planters peanuts and peanut butter, you're eating Mr. Birdsong's peanuts. But anyway, uh, we talked, George is, is, is working with me on this. He's aware of it. I'm sharing all the data with him. So. As, as Michael said, this is growing. It's growing, but we, it, and it's slow, tedious work, but we've got to keep doing it, and I think we're making some headway. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Judge Bray. Um, I think we're getting fairly close.